New York City, New York 2011. It was a morning like any other morning for Cynthia Jackson. She woke up at 5.30, brewed herself a cup of Starbucks coffee, toasted two slices of wheat bread, and turned on the 13-inch color TV that sat on the granite counter in her kitchen. She reached over and grabbed a green apple from the fruit basket and listened as the news reporter reiterated last night's news. Cynthia worked as a secretary for a bond brokerage firm. It was a nice-paying job that afforded her the $80,000 Victorian townhouse she and her two children lived in on Long Island. It was quite a step up from the shabby apartment she had. Grown up in in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, a lot of hard work and determination had taken her from the rough streets of North Philly to the quiet suburbs of Long Island. She considered herself blessed. Cynthia was spreading apple jelly on her toast when her nine-year-old son Trevor poked his head around the corner. Morning, Mom, he said sleepily. Good morning, baby. Cynthia returned with a smile. Trevor walked in the kitchen and Cynthia greeted him with a light kiss on his forehead. So what'll it be this morning, fruity pebbles or cocoa puffs? She said enthusiastically, trying to liven Trevor up. He had to be to school in an hour. Cocoa puffs. He said, a little more spirited, a smile slowly creeping onto his face. Cynthia turned to pour Trevor his bowl of cereal when a high-pitched voice scared her, causing her to spill the small brown balls all over the counter and floor. Mommy, mommy. Cindy screamed running into the kitchen and jumping up onto a stool. You know what today is? She asked both sweetly and exuberantly. Cindy was adorable. Seven years young, she was an exact replica of her mother. Only smaller. Her skin was cinnamon brown just like Cynthia's and her eyes were the same almond-shaped and amber color. Their hair was exactly the same texture but instead of the bob Cynthia sported today. Cindy donned two Afro puffs that were now loose because of sleeping on them. Of course I know what today is silly girl, it's Tuesday. Cynthia said teasing her daughter. No mommy, I know it's Tuesday but it's something else. Two, she said sounding slightly irritated but still sweet. M, the eleventh. Cynthia said still dragging her joke out. Mommy. The playful smile was still brilliant and her head was tilted to the side, but Cindy was getting frustrated. It's my birthday, Cynthia finished. She walked over to Cindy and tickled her side. You didn't really think mommy would forget your birthday, did you? No, Cindy giggled. Cynthia pulled a present from beneath the counter. Cindy tore the wrapping to shreds, even. Trevor's eyes were wide with curiosity as he watched little. Pieces of red and gold gift wrap fall to the floor. Oh, thank you, Mommy, Cindy said revealing a pair of pink and white Barbie skates. Tonight, we'll go the skating rink and try them out. What do you think about that? Cindy jumped up into her mama's arms. I love you, Mommy. Not too far away in nearby Staten Island. Bob Messenger, CEO of the same bond brokerage firm where Cynthia was employed, was also preparing for work. Bob was a 42-year-old man born and raised in Staten who loved two things his family and golf, before making the daily trip to Manhattan to work. He drank the rest of his Florida orange juice then kissed his wife, on the lips, Now don't be late tonight darling, you know Robert's soccer game is tonight, it's their championship and he'll really be looking forward to seeing you there, Bob's wife said after he removed his citrus-tasting lips from hers. I'll be there I promise. One more kiss and he was out the door, headed for work. Cynthia kissed Trevor and Cindy goodbye at their school and drove towards Manhattan for her eight hours of work. Cynthia's SUV weaved slowly through the congested New York. Traffic and just when it seemed like she would never make it to work, she arrived at the 110-story building where she made her living. Bob Messenger passed Cynthia's desk just as she was settling in. Hey, Cynthia. Hi, Bob, Cynthia said cordially. Bob dropped a stack of papers about a half an inch thick onto Cynthia's desk. She knew what was coming next. Do you think you could have this typed by eleven? I have a meeting at noon and this is very important. He formed it as a question, but Cynthia knew what Bob was really saying was, Have this typed by 10.30. I'll get right on it, he said. At exactly 8.48, while Cynthia typed there was a noise. 
a loud noise that rumbled the glass that surrounded the offices. Cynthia and Bob both stared out of their respective windows. For Bob, it all happened too fast for him to even realize what it was, but for Cynthia it was a moment of slow motion and heightened senses. He smelled fear and danger, heard the whistle of the approaching plane clearly, and with eyes wide with terror she watched as a plane's nose crashed through the window, glass flew and bricks collapsed. Dreadful screams filled the office and soon the roof collapsed onto her head and she heard no more. As flames engulfed Cynthia's office, she, Bob, and thousands more would die that day. Innocent people. 1,500 children of employees in Cynthia and Bob's firm alone lost their parents that day. The crash was heard around the world. At 9.03 a.m., approximately 15 minutes after the Trade Center's North Tower was struck, hijackers of a United Airlines flight headed straight at the South Tower, and just 56 minutes after the United crashed, the South Tower crumbled to the ground. The North Tower collapsed 29 minutes later, at exactly 10.28. Rick, there's complete pandemonium down here. News. Reporter shouted, covering her ears to block out the sounds of chaos behind her. You've just watched as the second of the Twin Towers was destroyed by planes claimed to be hijacked by terrorists. The kamikaze-like suicide attacks have completely destroyed the World Trade Center. There are dead bodies everywhere. Some mangled bodies clearly visible and others yet to be pulled from the rubble. People have plunged to their deaths from more than 80 stories high. The reporter paused and glanced away from the camera. Then returning her gaze to the camera she said, We've just gotten reports that the Pentagon has also been hit. Allegedly, 190 people were killed in the plane and on the ground. Again, 190 believed to be killed at the crash at the Pentagon. Wait. She glanced away again. The news just kept coming. We have also received word that a fourth, I repeat a fourth plane, also hijacked by terrorists, has crashed in a field southeast of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Once again, 19 terrorists have crashed hijacked commercial airliners into the World Trade Center in downtown Manhattan, the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., and a plane that may just have missed its mark, crashed in a field right outside of Pittsburgh. The reporter continued to describe what had just rocked America. It would become the worst attack on American soil since Pearl Harbor. Rescuers searched for survivors. Days after the crash, more than 5,000 people were missing and over 5,500 people died in the attacks. On September 15, the president announced that the nation was declaring war. He warned U.S. citizens that a sustained fight would be needed to defeat terrorists, and he identified Saudi-born Osama bin Laden, believed to be operating from Afghanistan, as the prime suspect in the attack.